coming up on the Ultimate Health Podcast. If you pay attention to the biochemistry and the metabolism science and the endocrinology, the science of hormones, if you want to get the fat out of your fat tissue, if you want to lose weight, you've got to minimize insulin. You have to have this negative signal of insulin deficiency. Like I said, the world is full of people when they do that. Like what happened to me when I said I lost 25 pounds in six weeks, it's now I completely understand that. It's like throwing a switch on your fat tissue and instead of accumulating it, like a ratchet wrench, instead of going in the direction of accumulation every day, suddenly you're going in the opposite direction. And it sounds like a diet book, but it's just, and the reason I wrote this book, The Case for Keto, is to explain to people, this is why it should work. This is why it seems to work. And clearly the world is full of people for whom it did work. So it's an argument to, you, for physicians to try and understand it so they can help their patients and for patients to experiment with it and try to understand it themselves. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 387. I'm Jesse Chappis, and I'm here to take your health to the next level. Each week, I'll bring you in-depth conversations with health and wellness leaders from around the world. And this week, I'm speaking with Gary Taubes. He's an investigative science and health journalist and co-founder of the nonprofit Nutrition Science Initiative. He's the author of The Case Against Sugar, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, and Good Calories, Bad Calories, which was published as The Diet Delusion in the UK. Gary just released a new book at the end of 2020 titled The Case for Keto, Rethinking Weight Control, and the Science and Practice of Low-Carb, High-Fat Eating. Today, we're going deep into this new book. Highlights of our conversation include how Gary studied physics in college and due to his weight realized his dreams of becoming an astronaut wouldn't happen, stop being afraid of fat, how sex hormones play a huge role in obesity, how conventional wisdom on nutrition is feeding us the wrong information, and the misinterpretation that obesity is caused by eating. Lots of great information in this one. I know you're really going to enjoy it. And if you do, be sure to share it with somebody in your life. I thank you ahead of time. Without further ado, here we go with Gary Taubes. Gary, welcome to the show. How you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me, Jesse. I'm looking forward to this discussion. And I want to start off talking about all the way back in college. And I found it interesting that you were a physics major in college. So let's talk about that time frame and... What was physics for you at that time? What were you going to become? Oh, I spent my youth reading science fiction books. So I wanted to be an astronaut. I also had a, I have an older brother who's an exceedingly smart man. He's now a mathematician at Harvard. So he went into physics. So I was competing with him. And I thought I could have a career maybe as an astronaut. And then uh, I got to graduate school at Stanford and realized that the world didn't really need a 215-pound astronaut. You, know, you could set a, send up a 160-pound person who's just as smart or smarter and save a lot of fuel. So I, I opted for my second choice, which was journalism. And you mentioned being 215 pounds. I can't exactly see how tall you are from the, the video of your chest up, but uh, were you husky at the time or what, what was your body type? Well, I'm six foot two, and I was uh, chubby, what we would have called chubby as a child. And then uh, puberty was kind to me, and I became an athlete. I played football. I was a defensive lineman in Division Two college football. And so my maximum weight was a hair under 240. If I ate constantly, which we did in college, I could get up to around 237, 238. And then, uh, yeah, after college, uh, I, as soon as football ended, I went on a diet. Back then, it was kind of calorie restricted and dropped about 30 pounds and stayed at about 210 for the next 10 years. I could tell you the whole history. You know, those of us who struggle with our weight can usually always tell you the history of their. Well, let's get into it a little bit more. What was this diet you got into after college? What did it look like? So, this would have been 1970, fall of 1976. I would guess I just uh, ate less and stopped doing, you know, we would do things when we were playing football. You, there was a, this was an Ivy League university in Boston, very well known. And there was a, a restaurant called Elsie's across the street from the dormitory I lived in. And you would go to Elsie's and get, the, you know, at 11 o'clock at night and get two sandwiches that might have constituted between them 1,500 calories. And that was a acceptable snack at uh 
the left. In fact, I had a one of my best friends was a New England hammer floor champion. He was six foot five and around two sixty, and we would go to McDonald's and have three or four, you know, double quarter pounders with cheese each for lunch. Or he would have six, and I would have four. And then you had uh, dorm cafeteria feeding, which was all you could eat, right? So basically, at that time, it was just eat like a somebody who wasn't dietarily challenged. And uh, it was relatively easy. This is a common phenomenon. It is relatively easy, particularly for men to lose weight when they're young. And uh, then when you find the things you used to do stop working as you slowly get heavier with each year that goes by. And what was the nutrition science like at that time? What were people into? Well, this I only learned... uh, you know, in the late 90s when I started as a nutrition journalist. I, I had a mother who was health conscious, so she followed the nutrition advice. And, um, you know, we ate cereals like Product 19 for breakfast because they were high in vitamins. And she wouldn't let a sugary cereal into the house, things like cocoa crisps. And lucky stars were never entering the doors of our house as a kid. But, um, you know, at that point in time, 1976 was a period when the low-fat dietary dogma was just starting to come in. So cardiologists had, uh, and epidemiologists, people who study uh, disease patterns, had begun to conclude erroneously, as I later found out, that dietary fat was a cause of heart disease. And by the mid-1980s, 1984, 85, they were putting sort of the whole country on a low-fat diet. So a series of government reports came out saying that we should, uh, two-thirds of the deaths in America were caused by the overconsumption of fat and saturated fat in particular. So we should all eat low-fat diets. And I lived through that era as well. Through the 1990s, I lived in Los Angeles and probably ate a diet that was maybe 15% fat, exceedingly low-fat diet, about as low as you can get. And with each year, I just got heavier and heavier. I gained two pounds. And I thought, this is what happens to men as they get older. You're always here. You know, when you hit 30, right, your metabolism slows down. That's the conventional wisdom. And so the calories start to add up. And I don't believe any of that anymore. Was it your weight and, and the challenges you had with that that brought you into journalism in the health and nutrition realm? No, actually. Um, so I started when I started into journalism, I had this physics background. So I was a physics writer. And my first book, this was I went to journalism school in Columbia. I got hired by a science magazine. I wanted to do investigative reporting. But the only job I could get out of Columbia was science writing. The only job allowed me to stay in New York City where my girlfriend lived at the time. I started doing science writing, and I got fascinated. Uh, well, I was sort of, my beat was physics, because my background was physics. And I went off to Geneva in 1985 to write a book about physicists who claimed to have discovered um, new fundamental particles. And today we would say I was embedded with those physicists. I lived with them for 10 months. I lived in the hostel at the laboratory. I spent all my waking hours with them. And it turned out they had screwed up. They hadn't discovered anything. They had made a mistake, and I was chronicling the mistake, and I was fascinated by it and how easy it is to screw up in science and how hard it is to do to get the right answer. So when I finished that book, I did a few other major investigative stories on science that was most likely wrong. You know, just like any career, any craft, you know, there are good plumbers and bad plumbers, there are good doctors and bad doctors, and there are good scientists and bad scientists, and the bad ones get the wrong answer. So my second book was called Bad Science. It was about this subject called Fusion, which was a great scientific fiasco of the late 1980s. And I spent three years working on it. I'm a bit obsessive. I interviewed 300 people for that one book. And I had a lot of fans in the physics community. A lot of the physicists, I interviewed a lot of the Nobel laureates. They liked my work. They liked the journalists out there pointing out when science was bad and when it was good. And so after that book came out, some of my friends in the physics world said, if you're really fascinated with bad science, you should look at the stuff in public health. It's terrible. And I would never thought about it. This is now early 1990s. I started looking at some of the stuff particularly that they were interested in. So the idea that electromagnetic fields from power lines could cause cancer, you know, brain cancer, leukemia. 
Today we think of it as cell phones causing cancer. It's the same bad science. And I did a piece on that for the Atlantic, and then I did a piece uh, on the kind of science that led people to make the wrong conclusions about power lines, which is the subject of epidemiology. And one thing led to another. Um, by the late 90s, I just stumbled into nutrition, and it turned out the science of nutrition was particularly bad. And by that, I mean people would get a hypothesis, like dietary fat causes heart disease. And, you know, the process of science is hypothesis and test, right? So you get an idea, and then you figure out a way to experimentally test whether or not it's right. And they would do the tests, and their idea would fail the tests. But they wouldn't care. They were so invested in it by that time that they would always look for something in the test that they could claim confirmed their idea. And I came into it with no preconceptions whatsoever. Like I said, I've been living in LA. I've been eating the kind of low-fat, low-salt diet we'd all been told to eat. I was getting heavier and less healthy, but I thought this was the best I could do because that's what we all do. And I did a series of investigative articles for the journal Science. Uh, the first one was on salt and blood pressure, and I spent nine months on it. While I was doing that story, one of the worst scientists I'd ever interviewed took credit not just for getting Americans to go on the low salt diet we were eating, but the low fat diet. And, um, you know, my second book was called Bad Science. I thought I had interviewed the worst scientists in the world, but this guy was clearly down there. And when I got off the phone with him, I called up my editor at Science, and I said, when I'm done writing about salt, I'm going to write about fat. Because if this guy was involved in any substantive way, I know there's a story in there. And it turned out he was, and there was a story, and I spent a year on that. Um, and that led to obesity, and obesity led to everything that followed. And I have not been able to get out of this space. Well, the new book is the case for keto, but the book I'm working on while that's coming out is on diabetes, because that's intimately related with all this as well. And talking about bad science back in the day, has the science gotten any better at all over the years to present day? I don't think so. It's gotten more technological. But the mistakes that I think were made, okay, so the caveat is everything I'm going to say is what I think clearly, and I could be wrong just like anyone could be wrong, but just to save us time, I won't make that caveat in every statement from here on in. The mistakes that were made were made by the 1960s. So they embraced, the nutrition research community embraced these ideas that were wrong, and then they built their edifice of nutrition and obesity science on top of that. It's like one of the stories I tell in passing in the case for keto, and one I hope we'll talk about a lot today, is this idea that obesity is caused by eating too much, which seems intuitively obvious. You get fatter because you're taking more calories and you expend in them. Medical literature that refer to it as, you know, obesity is an energy balance disorder. And that was embraced by the 1960s, and it's just considered dogma to question it is to be perceived as a quack, some kind of variation on a quack or a hoxter. I have friends who said, I can't be a quack because I'm not a doctor, so the best I can be is a whack job. You know, when you look at the, the history of it, it's... it's it's a failed theory. It doesn't explain anything, but modern obesity science is built on top of it. If I'm right, we have a real problem because you have an entire world of researchers doing sort of meaningless science because they've built everything they're doing on a failed idea. And the same is true in diabetes. It's a little more complicated and they're kind of moving towards truth, I think, because of some of the new technology that's available, like continuous glucose monitors. But we just had a lot of mistakes that were made. And then you get in the 1990s, uh, molecular biology sort of moves into obesity and nutrition and chronic disease study in a big way. And so you leave behind the sort of old fashioned science, which is a study of risk factors and, and hormones, and you move into new technologies, and you get all these fancy new technologies. And they're not really learning anything substantial, but they think they're learning a lot. And then on top of it, you, you know, you have to trust a journalist to you know whether or not what to believe, which is always a bad position. Well, that's where I was going to go. If we can't trust the science and it's not getting any better, who do we go to for information to you know base our decisions off of when it comes to health and wellness? One way to look at this, what's happened over the past 60 years. So 
Until the 1960s, the conventional wisdom was that carbohydrates were fat. And by carbohydrates, I mean carbohydrate-rich foods, starches, grains, sugars are fattening. And if you don't want to be fat, you don't need them. And there was a whole, a lot of science linking obesity to diabetes and heart disease and suggesting that whatever made people heavier, whatever makes us fat also makes us diabetic and gives us heart disease and cancer as well and Alzheimer's. And then in the 1960s, you get this idea that dietary fat causes heart disease, and we should all eat low-fat diets. And this is what my first investigation was for for science, and I, I said the science was just terrible. So because of that, this idea that we should avoid high-fat foods, you have us all moving towards high-carb foods in response and diets that are low and relatively low in fat and high in carbs. And that coincides with an obesity and diabetes epidemic. So for the past 60 years, well, one of the things when I did this book, The Case for Keto, I interviewed uh, 100 plus physicians who have converted to sort of my way of thinking. Not that it was necessarily mine. They think the same way I do now. They used to prescribe low-fat diets to their patients. Now they prescribe low-carb, high-fat diets to their patients, and they think they're making their patients healthier doing it. And I got to interview a lot of them. They're some very smart people. And one of them was a physician, a South African physician working in a little town just outside of Vancouver, said to me that for 60 years, we've been physicians have been expected to prescribe diet by hypothesis. So what that means is you have this hypothesis that eating a low-fat diet will prevent heart disease and make you live longer. It'll decrease your risk of having heart disease. So the doctor actually has no idea if it works, and the patient has no idea if it works. But you go on this diet with the hope that you're going to die later. It's going to increase your lifespan and your health span if you do it. You never really know if it does or not. So the way I describe it, if I were to have a heart attack while talking to you on the phone, which would be on Zoom, which would be unfortunate, we wouldn't know if the diet I ate shortened my life by 10 or 20 years or maybe extended my life by 10 or 20 years. I might have died 10 years ago had I not been eating the particular diet I'm eating. I might have died 10 years later. There's just no way to know. The alternative is you put people on these low-carb, high-fat diets, okay? So keto diet. And anyone can do this. Now, it used to be you had to buy Atkins' book, and then it was Atkins and Protein Power and Sugar Busters and South Beach, and now there's 50 books, including my new book coming out. And so you can read about this diet and go on this diet. A physician can put his patient on this diet, and you see the patient get healthier. You experience yourself getting healthier. So you lose weight, blood pressure comes down, your blood sugar comes under control, you have more energy. Or, I mean, a whole host of healthier things happen. And so you don't actually have to take anyone's word for it, okay? You can try it yourself and see what works. And then when I write in my book, The Case for Keto, what I'm arguing is, look, there's so much evidence that this makes people healthy that it makes people who are obese leaner, that it makes people who are diabetic able to come off their drugs, their blood sugar controlling medications. It helps people with hypertension often can get off their blood pressure medication. So they're definitively getting healthy. The physicians who have embraced it have done it. You know, they all went into medicines and wanted to make people healthy. And then they ended up finding out that it feels like internal medicine and family medicine are just basically managing chronic diseases. And the chronic diseases are diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and they're given meds because that's what they do. And then they have to up the dose or give different meds as the diseases get slowly worse. And then they find, I can put my patient on this, and the patient gets healthier. And I can take them off meds instead of putting them on meds. So what the internet has done is it's taken the diet world out of the away from the gatekeepers or the nutritionists, the dietitians, and the people who have embraced all this arguably very bad science. And it's given everyone else an opportunity to decide for themselves what to believe and then try it for themselves. So worst things anyone ever said about it are true. It's not going to kill you within a month. So you could try it for a month and see what happens. That brings up my next question. We are talking about short-term results here. And and they are profound in nature. 
But are there any long-term studies showing the results of a low-carb, high-fat diet? Or do we just have to extrapolate from the short-term results and assume that it's good long-term? The latter. So this is the caveat. We have studies up till two years, okay? And those studies over two years say that this is the healthiest diet you could do, with the exception of LDL cholesterol, which we'll have to get back to. There's a company in San Francisco called Verda Health, which has been using telemedicine to put their patient clients on with, into what they call nutritional ketosis, which is a keto diet. And they have been publishing papers of up to, you know, with two years duration of a clinical trial with their patients and of some 26 risk factors for heart disease. 22 of them get better and three stay the same. But the problem is we don't have longer than two years. And we can really get into the weeds here with the discussion of, you know, because you have studies in this field of observational epidemiology I mentioned. Uh, the most famous of these studies is the Nurses Health Study at Harvard. And they follow people for 20 years. So you get a cohort of people, 130,000 nurses. You ask them what they're eating with a survey. You figure out, you know, you get their medical records, you know, what their health status is. Ideally, they're relatively healthy when you start, and then you follow them ever after, 20, 30 years into the future now, and you see who gets sick and who stays healthy, and then you look at what they were eating, and you make the assumption that what they were eating is the reason why these people got healthy and these people got sick, which is a hypothesis. It's not a fact. And from those studies, you conclude that people who eat high-fat diets tend to be less healthy than people who don't. People who eat a lot of animal products tend to be less healthy than people who don't. So when you look at these long-term epidemiological studies, you worry about what happens if you eat a ketogenic diet. A hypothesis is an idea, basically, about what's right and what's wrong. So we have a hypothesis that if you go on a carbohydrate-restricted diet, we should define a ketogenic diet as a diet in which you pretty much abstain from eating starches, grains, and sugars. And so you eat a lot of green leafy vegetables, a lot of fatty foods. Uh, it could be animal products. It could be vegetable fats. We could talk about that. But you're getting most of your calories from fat. And in a classic ketogenic diet of the kind I consume, it's animal fats. It's the kind that's supposed to give you heart disease. So if you want to know if that's going to harm you, you have to do an experiment. Remember we said experiments, hypothesis, and tests. So you randomize people to eat either a low-carb ketogenic diet or some other diet that's lower in fat and higher in carbohydrates. And there's over 100 of those studies have been done. They run as long as two years. and Almost without exception, the low-carb, high-fat, maybe ketogenic or not diet comes out better, healthier. People, their heart disease risk factors go down, their diabetes gets better, they have experience more weight loss. We know that people don't adhere well to the diets in these trials for a lot of reasons, but they get healthier. If you look at a population through this window of epidemiology and you follow it for 20 years, you find at the end of 20 years, people who seemed to eat mostly plants, mostly plant fats, and shied away from animal products and saturated fat tend to be healthier than the people who did the opposite. So the people who do those studies don't advocate eating like I do because they worry about what they're seeing in their long epidemiological surveys. From my perspective, their surveys only provide, they used to be called, these kind of surveys used to be called hypothesis generating data. So they give you a hypothesis, which is that people with plant-based diets are healthy. Now you have to test it. The way you test it is in a randomized controlled trial. And the long-term trials have never been done and probably never will be done. And the short-term trials say that hypothesis is wrong. So it's a complicated issue. And again, in my book, I go through this briefly. I want people to understand why the ketogenic diet has been such a phenomenon for the last 160 to 200 years, why it's never gone away, why it remains the stuff of fad diet books, why, and why it particularly is so popular today, and why they might actually find a physician today who will ask them, suggest not only that they go on that diet to bring their weight under control, but they stay on that diet for life. 
And in order to do that, you have to understand a little bit why you're often going to be reading the opposite of the newspapers. You mentioned a couple hundred years there that this diet's been around. What does the history show? Who's the first person to, you know, write about this and experiment with it? The most famous book ever written about food is called The Physiology of Taste, written by a French lawyer who quit his job just to basically live well and write about food, uh, Jean-Antel Briat Savarin. And he published his book in 1825. It was actually published after he passed away. It stayed in print ever since, which is, other than the Bible, I'm not sure any other than Shakespeare. Those are about the only books it ever had. And Briat Savarin talked about obesity. He said, look, I had conversations over my life with 500 people with obesity, and they're always always telling me how much they love bread and how much they love starch and how much they love sweets. So the sugar was hard to come by in the beginning of the 19th century. So it wasn't as much of a player as it is today. And um, we know that we fatten animals, you know, uh, livestock by feeding them grains and starches. So it makes perfect sense that that's how we fatten humans. And if you don't want to be fat, you have to, he called more or less rigid abstinence from the starches and grains and sugars in the diet. Forty years later, there was a famous British undertaker named uh, Banting who was obese and had tried everything. He tried exercise. He goes through then, finally had a doctor, an oral surgeon he had gone to because he had hearing trouble. And the oral surgeon said, well, that's because of your obesity. And put him on a low-carb diet. Uh, A lot of alcohol. But other than that, very similar to, you know, Atkins and protein power and sugar busters and all the rest. And he lost 50 pounds in nine months. He was in his 50s already, I think. And he wrote a pamphlet about it and became the first best-selling international diet pamphlet. And it was sold everywhere. Crown Prince of Germany went on the diet. The King of France went on the diet. And by the late 19th century, everyone was acknowledging there were all kinds of variations of these very low-carb, animal-rich diets being promoted all throughout Europe by the leading authorities in German medicine and Austrian medicine and French medicine and kind of faded away with the First World War and uh, wasn't much research into obesity at all until, certainly not obesity and diet, until the late 1990s with the awareness of the um, obesity epidemic. But along this way, diet book authors kept sort of reinventing this diet. So in the 1950s, it was a um, physician at the DuPont Corporation in Pennington who published studies on it and lectured at Harvard on it, published in the Wingman Journal of Medicine. And then it was an OBGYN in Brooklyn named Herman Taller who wrote a famous book called Calories Don't Count. And then it was Atkins. And every time it happened, the medical community basically, as they had with this first British undertaker in 1860, said, these guys are quacks. They don't know what they're talking about. They're writing fad diets. Uh, You can't have a diet that advocates that people don't have to eat less. Because we know that fat people get fat because they eat too much. So if a diet book says you can eat as much as you want, then it's purely clearly quackery. And so we have this constant series of books. When I started doing research on this, uh, the early, around 2001 for a New York Times Magazine cover story, I was interviewing the leading obesity and diabetes, chronic disease researchers in the country. And many of them said, oh yeah, if you want to lose weight, this is the way to do it. This is how I would do it. You know, it works great, but they were afraid of the saturated fat content of the diet. So they would eat an Atkins diet themselves, a keto diet, if they want to lose weight. And they knew it. They all knew it worked. We should discuss that. Now I'm going to take a quick break from my chat with Gary to give a shout out to our new show partner, Garden of Life. One of Garden of Life's products I'm most excited about is their grass-fed whey protein. I haven't had a whey protein since I was a teen after workouts, and it definitely wasn't grass-fed. I'm so excited to have this clean option to add to my smoothies again. It's not only free of hormones and antibiotics, but Garden of Life is very proud to have the only non-GMO project verified way. It's designed to refuel and repair muscles, support recovery, and protect your immunity so you can get the most out of your training and workouts. 
and one scoop contains 24 grams of protein. It comes in chocolate and vanilla. Personally, I've been using the vanilla and love how it tastes in my smoothies. Garden of Life also has a wide array of other amazing health products. Be sure and check them out. Visit your local health food store or favorite online health retailer to get Garden of Life's grass-fed whey protein. Now I'm going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Organifi. Organifi Immunity provides your body with 10 immune health supporting superfoods in one delicious glass. It contains mushroom beta glucan from Rishi Mushroom. Mushroom beta glucan acts fast, quickly reducing symptoms of sickness by over 30%. It also contains acerola cherry, orange, ginger, turmeric, baobab fruit, Mediterranean olive leaf extract, and whole food derived zinc. Each box contains 14 single serve packets that are easy to stash away in your purse or backpack to take with you on the go. Mix one packet with 8 to 10 ounces of filtered water once or twice daily. Take one serving for daily immune health support and two servings if you're feeling under the weather. As a listener of the show, you get 20% off your Organifi purchase by going to ultimalpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that's ultimalpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O R G A N. IFI. Support your immune system with the superfoods and Organifi immunity. And now back to my chat with Gary. First, I want to talk about some terms here that we're kind of using interchangeably. You've talked about Atkins. We've talked about low carb, high fat and ketogenic. For the purposes of our discussion, are we using those interchangeably? No. So let's... um... Okay, the phrase I use in my book, and I admit that it rolls off no tongues, is low carbohydrate, high fat slash ketogenic diet. And then the book ends up being called The Case for Keto, so everyone thinks it's just about keto, even though the subtitle includes the phrase low carb, high fat. So the basic idea in all these diets is, and I would argue virtually every dietary approach to obesity is more or less, using the phrase from Briat Sabra, more or less rigid abstinence to carbohydrates. So grains, starches, sugars, you pretty much have to abstain from. And the argument is that they actually cause the fat. The reason you get fat is because of the effect of those foods on the hormonal regulation of fat tissue. So for those of us who are predisposed to get fat, those foods elevate our insulin levels, elevated insulin works to put fat in your fat tissue. That's just textbook science, although the medical community hasn't considered it relevant to obesity. The catch is if you get rid of the sugars, starches, and grains in your diet, that usually represents about 50% of your calories. And so you want to replace your calories. The other two choices are protein, well, protein, fat, and alcohol leave alcohol out of it for now. Protein is necessary for a healthy body, for you know repair, and we need a minimum amount, but protein also stimulates some blood sugar, uh, stimulates an insulin response in the pancreas with about 60% of the calorie that the component parts of the protein get converted to glucose, the amino acids. So you're left with replacing your carbohydrate calories mostly with fat. So more or less rigid abstinence to carbs means a low-carb, high-fat diet. And when you eat uh, animal products as sources of fat, like butter, eggs, dairy, meat, fish, and fowl, all sources of protein tend to come with a lot of fat attached. So unless you really go out of your way to eat skinless chicken breasts or very low-fat fish or very lean meat, you're going to get most of your calories from fat. So a carb-restricted diet is a high-fat diet, and it should be a high-fat diet. And then the question is, are the carbs low enough that you actually transition into this state called ketosis? So the way that works is your liver generates ketones from the fat you're metabolizing. So if you're using fat for fuel, your liver will take some of that fat and turn it into these molecules called ketones, and the ketones will be used to fuel your brain and your heart and other organs. Or vitally a vital aspect of healthy human physiology, although they weren't perceived that way, and a lot of doctors still don't because they don't actually know the science. So when you're metabolizing fat for fuel, which is what you want to do with both the fat you eat and the fat you store, your liver will take some of that fat and turn it into ketones. When your ketones are above a certain level, you're in ketosis. And so a keto diet is a diet where technically you can measure 
you know, uh, significant ketones in your urine or in your breath or in your blood. There are various ways to test it. So a low-carb, high-fat diet can be ketogenic and that you get a lot of ketones, or it could be not quite ketogenic in which you get barely few, any ketones. But in both cases, you're abstaining from carbs and replacing those carbs with fat. So when I did the research for this book, one of the things I wanted to do, I've been more or less advocating for this dietary approach to obesity since 2002. But now with so many physicians on board, maybe a few tens of thousands worldwide, by my rough, very rough estimate, I could interview these physicians and see sort of what worked for them with their patients and themselves, what didn't work, what the challenges were, how they had come to think about this, because these are some very smart, caring, concerned doctors. What surprised me was none of them really cared if their patients were in ketosis or not. They have this waiting room that's filling up with patients who suffer from obesity or diabetes or hypertension, sometimes all three, and they want to make those patients healthier. And what they want to do is get them off the carbohydrates. Stop being afraid of fat, which we've been taught to be afraid of fat for 50 years now. Embrace the fat in the diet, get off the carbohydrates. And then if they happen to be in ketosis, great, but they don't want them focusing on ketosis. So... In an ideal world, to me, this is just a low-carb, high-fat diet in which you can use ketosis as a means to see how well, sort of how much fat you're metabolizing or how well you're metabolizing the fat in your, that you've stored in the fat in your diet. I think earlier you referred to your diet as keto or ketogenic. Are you measuring ketones or is that a concern for you or you're just making sure you're in that high-fat, low-carb realm? The way I think about it is I just don't eat starches and grains. I actually worry about the fat I eat just because, you know, I spent as much time reviewing this science as any human being alive. I think I know it as well as anyone alive. I was conditioned to think that butter would kill me, and I eat a lot of butter, and I can't. I talked about this in the first New York Times Magazine article I wrote in 2002, where I said I would go to breakfast and have eggs and bacon or eggs and sausage and wait to have my heart attack. And I'm still waiting 20 years later. But I just don't eat starches and grains and sugars. I avoid them. So what's left is green vegetables, a lot of animal products, nuts, a lot of dairy, eggs. And that's it. And I've never checked ketones. Although on occasions, my wife has commented that my breath smells like ketones, and she's very sensitive to it. I trust her judgment. She's not fond of it. So So she is not into the ketogenic diet? She is a mostly vegetarian. She grew up in Los Angeles and Laurel Canyon in the 70s and 80s when this that was the thing. And so she has issues with eating animals. She has issues with me eating animals. I have issues with eating animals. I just don't know what else to do if I want to stay lean and healthy. She gets heavier when she eats more carbs and she gets leaner when she more or less rigidly abstains from them. So often her meals will be, um, you know, green vegetables and eggs and uh, this German uh, pumpernickel bread that's a very low glycemic index bread. And and she can't eat the way I eat. At one point we had to build a deck outside our house. I had to take a home loan so we could spend a few tens of thousands of dollars building a deck so I could get a barbecue and cook my meat outside. Then she got a dog. We cook meat for the dog, and now she can't complain when the meat is cooked inside because that would imply that she loves her husband and her children less than the dog, which we're not going to get into. Well, I think this is an important thing to dig a little bit deeper into because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there whose partner isn't totally on board with the same dietary philosophy and eating the same way. So how do you guys go about making that work when it's time to prepare a meal? You're talking about going out and barbecuing. Is there a lot of overlap or are you preparing each your own meal or how does that work? She will eat chicken. So chicken meals are for the whole family. If there's a red meat of some kind, then I will cook it for myself and my kids and my boys and I'll make something for her. She'll get by with just the vegetables and a small portion of whatever the starch is. My kids, you know, are as carb craved as any other children you'll find. So they eat probably a healthier diet than most, but they still get cereal for breakfast and starches and breads. And I make sure that 
not a meal goes by that they don't have that choice on their plate. Less sugar than their pure group, I'm sure. That's less negotiable. And did you say you've been on a similar type diet to what you are today since the early 2000s? Yeah, I first, um, again, through the 90s, I was living in Los Angeles and in Venice Beach, close to the beach. And so it's a very sort of hip new age environment. And I had been put on a very low carb, high fat diet by a trainer that a friend of mine was using. And uh, he said I would lose six pounds in two weeks and I'd have more energy, which I did both. And so I stayed on it ever after, even though very religiously, even though I kept gaining two pounds a year. And then I was doing this piece for science. This was about 1999, uh, 2000 on the the low fat dogma, the evidence that dietary fat causes heart disease. And I was simultaneously doing an article for another science magazine on the mathematics of the stock market. And I was interviewing an economist at MIT. We got to talking about good science and bad science, which is my obsession and one of my favorite subjects. And uh, he said, well, if you're writing about uh, nutrition science, you got to try to act the stock market. He had a colleague at the Wharton Business School where Trump graduated from, and uh, his colleague's father lost 200 pounds on Atkins, and the economist I was interviewing is Asian-American, and he said he lost 40 pounds, he basically gave up white rice. So I figured, you know, sure, I'll try anything. I, at this point in time, weighed about 228 pounds, 225, 230. I was eating my low-fat diet. I went back to LA, and I shifted to an Atkins diet, so it's you know, eggs and bacon or eggs and sausage or eggs and sausage and bacon for breakfast. And then for lunch, I would get, you know, half a roast chicken or a piece of meat and green vegetables. So you go out to eat, starving writers go out to eat every meal, which wasn't good financially, but it got you out of the house. You know, if there's something like a roast chicken on the menu, you say, have the roast chicken, please hold the potatoes, give me a double order of vegetables. Uh, a chain of Argentine restaurants in LA called the Gaucho Grill, where you can get cheap, big portions of meat. So I would go with my friends. They would have skinless chicken breasts and salad and potatoes. And I would have like a steak and salad. And they had an appetizer that was melted mozzarella cheese and pepperoni. And I'd say, this is my health food diet. I mean, it's completely contrary to everything I'd ever believed. I was kind of convinced it was killing me because, and, but I thought, you know, I'm not married. I don't have kids. My parents have passed away. Nobody's going to miss me except my cats. What the heck? And I lost 25 pounds in six weeks effortlessly, eating what seemed to be an enormous amount of food. And I used to exercise an hour a day. That's what you do in Los Angeles. You exercise an hour a day. Um, you don't go to cafes or shopping. You work out. At least in the part of LA, I would, you know, uh, rollerblade up the beach to Malibu and back. It's like 10 miles total. Or I'd go for a six mile run or I would do these famous steps in Santa Monica Canyon for 45 minutes. And I did it all so that I thought, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm burning so many calories. I can eat the way I want to eat and not get too much fatter. And suddenly I'm just losing weight anyway. I felt great. And I'm eating these foods that we had been programmed to think would kill us, but also most men tend to like, you know, eggs and bacon. And I don't think I'd had a piece of red meat in a decade. And suddenly I'm having it, you know, every other day. And it was fascinating. It's a fascinating experience. Everyone should try it. It's entirely different from any other way of losing weight. So in the 80s, when I lived in New York, I was always dieting. Again, I was a a defensive lineman in football. I'm the kind of body type that gets heavier as we get older. I also was boxing some in my 80s. So I was always on a diet. And when you're on a diet, I was always hungry. You must probably have gone through this where you're just, you're measuring the amount of food you can eat and you're waiting until the next snack you can have. And suddenly you try this and the hunger goes away. You seem to be eating enormous portions of food and you're losing weight simultaneously. And it's sort of fascinating. And this was all before I did my research. And then, then, of course, I fell off the diet, started having desserts after every meal, and the weight came back. And then when I did the research for this first New York Times Magazine article, and I started to realize what the science really was and what was happening to my body, I realized that this is just the way I need to eat if I want to maintain a healthy weight. 
and I've pretty much done it ever since. You mentioned there you weren't sure if the diet was killing you, at least in the early days. Were you concerned about getting lab work done? Is that something you've had testing done over the years to see what your numbers are like? And how have those, you know, changed over the years? Well, the problem is, and this is where it gets complicated. So I had spent a year doing this investigation for the journal Science. It was, you know, say mid 1999 to mid 2000 on whether or not dietary fat caused heart disease. And if it did it the way it did, it was through cholesterol. That's the theory, right? So saturated fat raises your LDL cholesterol. You get accumulation of atherosclerotic plaques in your heart. You have a heart attack, you die. I had interviewed about 140 people for that story, and I'd read much of the research literature. In fact, I'd printed out stacks of foot high, and I'd given them to researchers I respected in the medical community just to sort of peer review, you know, what foot high stacks of the relevant tests. So I knew that what I was saying was was right. And I had come to realize that total cholesterol is a meaningless risk factor for heart disease and that LDL is a very bad risk factor for heart disease. And the best risk factor is HDL cholesterol. And your HDL goes up when you eat saturated fat compared to carbohydrates. And I wrote about this in my first Times Magazine story. If you replace, if you eat, say, Get rid of 500 calories of pasta, which for me is about two thirds of a, of a lunch, <laughs> and replace it with 500 calories of porterhouse steak, your heart disease risk factor should get better. So I didn't really see any reason to do a traditional lipid profile. I had to get life insurance about uh, 2008. I now had kids and a family and I wanted to get life insurance. So I got the lipid test, and everything was fine. About five years later, I did it again around 2013. Now very sophisticated uh, lipid test. So not only are you looking at LDL and HDL and triglycerides, which are kind of the classic things you measure, but LDL particle size and LDL particle number. And I now by this time become friends with the people who have created the tests for LDL particle number and the people the researchers who have been arguing that it's, we should worry more about the size of the LDL particles than the number of LDL particles and vice versa. I know all these people. And by 2013, when I had the test done, my LDL was bad. So remember, everything else is good. My weight is great. My HDL is great. My triglycerides are great. My blood sugar is great. And this is a common finding. This is the complication with the study. It's sort of, I joke that it's God's joke. You have this way of eating that will make everything about you healthy. Virtually every meaningful risk factor for heart disease gets better when you get rid of the carbs, the starches, sugars, and grains, and replace them with saturated fat-rich animal products, except LDL. And for some portion of the population, we don't know how much, could be one in 10, could be one in five, could be one in three, our LDL gets worse. And LDL is the only thing the establishment cares about, because there's a multi, many, many billion dollar industry pushing drugs to lower LDL levels. So the way I discuss it in the book, because this is what I'll have, used to be people would go on these diets, they would lose 50 pounds, their LDL would go up and the doctor would tell them they were killing themselves get them back onto their old diet, they would gain the 50 pounds back, but their LDL would be fine. Nowadays, there's enough doctors who are informed on this that they'll lose the weight and they'll say, look, keep doing whatever you're doing, but I don't like your LDL, let's put you on a statin. And I have friends who would put me on a statin, doctors who I respect who would write a prescription for me to be on a statin to lower my LDL. And they're pretty benign statins. I have other friends I respect who think the worst thing I could do is go on a statin because of the side effects of the statin. And originally this book was called, by the way, How to Think About How to Eat, a Weight Control Manifesto. Because I just wanted to say, this is how I think we should think about this. Look at your other risk factors for heart disease. So my men on my father's side of my family live into their 90s. The only men on my mother's side of their family went crazy. So I don't know what I'm dealing with there, other than that mental stability isn't in the mix. So I have no family history of heart disease. All my other risk factors are good. My weight now is the best it's ever been. I'm at 
64, I'm as healthy as I've been. I seem to be as strong as I've ever been. I'm 207 or 8 pounds, I would guess, since COVID. I haven't had access to my scale, but that's what I'm guessing. So I personally choose not to go on the statin. And if I, there are, you know, the NIH, for instance, and the American Heart Association have these cholesterol calculators where you can put in your numbers, your age, your weight, your height, your cholesterol numbers, your blood pressure, whether you're a smoker, and it'll give you a risk profile. What's your risk of having a heart attack in 10 years? Uh, for mine, with or without statins, it's low. I can put in my number without statins, and I can put in the numbers. Let's say I drop my LDL by 50 points with some incredibly powerful statin, and it barely changes the number. So I choose not to deal with the high LDL and stick with the diet. Are you afraid doing that and knowing your LDL is elevated, or do you feel pretty confident? It's just complicated. I, I live in a weird place in the world. Because I've been one of the drivers of this low-carb revolution, for what it's on, that's what I'll call it for now, and because there are so many people who take issue with it, it seems like there are people out there who are always waiting for us to drop dead to prove that they were right or wrong. It wouldn't, because again, even if I did, you wouldn't know whether the diet kept me alive or killed me prematurely. I often write, you know, emails to my friends or texts, which is like, it's, you know, you end up thinking about this a lot. When ideally we wouldn't think about it at all. When I first got into this research, I was kind of offended by how bad the science was, and I was offended by the diet police. The fact that I hadn't eaten an avocado. I lived in California and didn't eat avocados because they were a high fat food. I hadn't had peanut butter in 10 years because it was a high fat food. And like I said, I probably hadn't had a piece of red meat in 10 years. So I was offended by the diet police. But as soon as I found out how bad their science was, and then now I've kind of become a different version of the diet police. My wife has an Instagram account, and somebody um, commented to one of her posts, this woman is married to Gary Taubes. Can you imagine being married to that? <laughs> Not him, that. And I was like, okay. So it's just, yeah, I think about it. I worry about it. Because, again, it's just the world we live in. If something were to happen, well, I'll give you an example. Steve Jobs dies of pancreatic cancer, and his nutritional counselor is Dean Ornish, who promotes a very low-fat diet for everything. And apparently, Steve did not get the kind of more intensive therapy for the cancer that he could have got because he believed that he could fix it by diet, and he didn't. So when Steve Jobs dies, people like me tend to think Dean Ornish was responsible. But this, by the same token, if anyone gets sick in my world, I have to say to myself, if this was Dean's, if he was eating Dean's way, I would blame Dean. So if he's eating like I'm eating or she's eating like I'm eating, I have to seriously consider the possibility that the diet is the reason why she got sick, she got cancer, she had, a, you know, whatever, he had a heart attack. And people are always dying. That's what we end up doing eventually. So it's a weird situation where you're kind of thinking about it all the time. So yeah, I worry about it. I hope I have my father's genes and not my mother's father's genes. <laughs> you know, we'll see what happens. And even then we won't know. That's what I was going to say. At the root of all this, like we keep coming back to the fact that we don't know. Whenever somebody passes, maybe they've gotten an extra 10 years because of that diet. Maybe they would have had an extra 10 years if they're on a different diet. So that's an important underlying theme. You know, at the heart of all this is obesity, right? Or fat accumulation. And most of us who go on diets go on diets because we're trying to be leaner than either 10 pounds leaner or 50 pounds leaner or 200 pounds leaner, but that's what we want. Ideally, we want to be healthier, but for the most part, we tend to be motivated by weight. So the conventional wisdom, as I mentioned, since the 1930s, is that obesity is caused by consuming more calories than you expend. And the only way to lose weight is to eat less. And what I realized doing my first book, which took me five years from 2002 to 2007, was that there was always an alternative hypothesis, which is that obesity is a hormonal disorder, just like diabetes is a hormonal disorder. And by the 1960s, the way to think about it was that obesity and diabetes are both, they're two sides to the same coin. And they're both insulin disorders. And what researchers learned in this period is that insulin is a hormone that regulates fat accumulation. So 
diabetes people think of it as the hormone that controls blood sugar. But one of the ways it controls blood sugar is when you eat a meal with the carbs in it and your blood sugar is going up, it tells your fat tissue to store all the fat. And it keeps the fat in the fat tissue so you can burn the carbohydrates. And then this, again, is sort of textbook science and biochemistry and metabolism. But it never got into the obesity world because the obesity people thought that you get fat because you eat too much. And the way to get people thin is to get them to eat less and you have to tell them to eat less. And any hormonal explanation is just an excuse for people who suffer from obesity not to do what lean people do, which is eat less and exercise. Eat in moderation, or as Michael Pollan said, eat not too much. But this sort of hormonal explanation is obesity is an insulin signaling disorder, and your fat tissue is too sensitive to the insulin it's seeing in the bloodstream, and so it's always holding on to fat. And if it's always holding on to fat, it also means you're always hungry because you're never having that fat to burn. I'm simplifying the hormones here a bit. So by this alternative thinking, if you want to lose weight, you have to minimize your insulin levels. In the mid-1960s, this very famous researcher named Rosalind Yallo and her colleague Solomon Burson, they invented the technology that allows us to measure hormones in the bloodstream. And Yallo later won the Nobel Prize for it after Burson passed away. Yeah, Yallo and Burson said that's what required to get fat out of fat tissue is the negative signal of insulin deficiency. So the fat has to basically see no insulin before it'll release fat into the fat tissue. And your lean tissue has to see almost as little insulin before it'll burn fat for fuel. So if you want to get thinner, you have to lower insulin. And the more you struggle with your weight, this is sort of the only way to do it by diet. So there are other hormones that could influence fat accumulation, like sex hormones. The best you can do by diet from this sort of hormonal perspective is minimizing your insulin levels. And the way you do that is minimize your carb consumption and keep your protein relatively low. Fat is the one nutrient that doesn't stimulate insulin. So now you're kind of stuck eating something like this low-carb, high-fat ketogenic diet if you want to lose weight. That's the argument. There are people out there. I talk about these people in the book. Like I have a friend now. When I met him, he was a, a law student at Yale. But he had been, when he was 18 years old, he had been 400 pounds. And his father gave him a copy, Obesity Runs in His Family, had an uncle who weighed almost 800 pounds until he went on a, um, uh, got bariatric surgery. So his father gave him a copy of my 2002 New York Times Magazine article, and he basically lived on fatty meat. Father would buy fat ground meat at Costco for him. And he was an 18-year-old man, very smart. And he lost 130 pounds in four months. And the point is, when you eat like that and you lower your insulin like that, that's what should happen. Physiologically, that's what should happen. So whether there are long-term side effects, whether there are, you know, there might be some sort of magical combination of nutrients for different people that maximizes this effect. If you pay attention to the biochemistry and the metabolism science and the endocrinology, the science of hormones, if you want to get the fat out of your fat tissue, if you want to lose weight, you've got to minimize insulin. You have to have this negative signal of insulin deficiency. Like I said, the world is full of people when they do that. Like what happened to me when I said I lost 25 pounds in six weeks, it's now I completely understand that. It's like throwing a switch on your fat tissue and instead of accumulating it like a ratchet wrench instead of going in the direction of accumulation every day suddenly you're going in the opposite direction and it sounds like a diet book but it's just and the reason i wrote this book the case for keto is to explain to people this is why it should work this is why it seems to work and clearly the world is full of people for whom it did work so it's an argument to you, for physicians to try and understand it so they can help their patients and for patients to experiment with it and try to understand it themselves. Now I'm going to take another quick break from my chat with Gary to give a shout out to our brand new show partner, Bioptimizers. Bioptimizers has an incredible supplement called Magnesium Breakthrough. This is a complete formula that includes naturally derived forms of all seven forms of supplemental magnesium and it doesn't contain any synthetic additives or preservatives. 
This is the most potent oral magnesium you'll ever find. Magnesium is one of the most important minerals for all aspects of health. It participates in over 600 different biochemical reactions in your body. Magnesium promotes heart health, helps the body relax and deal with stress, and improves mood and sleep quality. As a listener of the show, you get 10% off your Bioptimizers purchase by going to bioptimizers.com slash ultimate health. Again, that URL is bioptimizers.com slash ultimate health. And Bioptimizers is spelled B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S. Get all seven forms of magnesium in one with Magnesium Breakthrough. Now I'm going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Paleo Valley. The 100% grass-fed beef sticks from Paleo Valley allow you to snack clean. They're made with 100% grass-fed and finished beef, raised in the USA by family farmers, focused on using rotational grazing practices and creating lush green pastures free of chemicals and pesticides. The beef sticks come in five delicious flavors, and my favorite two are original and jalapeno. 100% grass-fed beef contains higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids and more vitamins and minerals. And 100% grass-fed beef is actually good for the environment. Conventionally raised grain-fed beef is indeed terrible for the environment, However, 100% grass-fed beef helps to regenerate soil and grasslands, which in turn helps to pull carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back in the soil where it belongs. As a listener of the podcast, you get 15% off your Paleo Valley purchase by going to ultimatepodcast.com slash Paleo Valley. Again, that's ultimatepodcast.com slash Paleo Valley. Snack healthy with 100% grass-fed beef sticks from Paleo Valley. And now back to my chat with Gary. Let's talk about individual differences between people. We've alluded to this a few times throughout the conversation, and you just talked about your friend there and how he had obesity running in the family. Why is it that certain people just tend to put on weight easier? Does it come back to the insulin? I would argue on some level it has to, but again, it's complicated. So there are clearly, every hormone has some effect on fat accumulation. So hormones are telling your body to do something you know, flee or fight, reproduce, uh, you know, eat or sleep or grow. And when they do it, they're telling your body to make the fuel available also. It's a very complex, wonderful system that evolved over millions of years for us to thrive. So every hormone, for the most part, tells your fat tissue to release fat into the bloodstream so that whatever else it's telling your body to do, the body can use that fat for fuel. And then insulin is a hormone that dominates, is the one hormone that really tells your fat to store fat. So on some level, despite all the other reasons, any of these hormones can be dysfunctional. So one of the observations that was made by um, a lot of the science was worked out in the 1920s and 30s when the German and Austrian medical community was the most advanced in the world, and they were doing far and away the best medical science. And it's the science of endocrinology of hormones kind of matured in that period of time. And, you know, sex hormones have play a huge role in obesity. So as we get in fat accumulation, so as you get uh, testosterone stimulates the release of fat from your fat cells. So as you get older, as men get older and they secrete less testosterone, they gain weight around their stomachs, particularly because those cells are sort of testosterone sensitive. And as you secrete less testosterone, they tend to accumulate fat rather than release. And women tend to gain fat below the waist as they go through menopause because they secrete less estrogen. And estrogen works to inhibit fat accumulation. So as you secrete less you accumulate more, and that happens below the waist. So different cells and different parts of the body respond to different hormones differently. So there's a sort of infinite number of combinations of ways that you could accumulate too much fat or too little if you're emaciated, which we don't see any much. But it always comes back, the link to the diet is primarily through insulin. There are other hormones, glucagon, which is also secreted by the pancreas and kind of works. It's a works contrary to insulin, and that's stimulated by protein consumption. So if you eat carbohydrates, you only stimulate insulin. The insulin tells your fat cells to store fat. But if you eat protein, you'll stimulate insulin and glucagon and growth hormone. And the glucagon will tell your fat will work against the insulin with the fat accumulation, and it'll tell lean tissue to take up fat to use it for fuel and take up protein to use it for repair. And the growth hormone will tell the lean tissue and the, to take up fuel and use it for repair and growth. So there's a sort of 
all of these very many ways that everybody's individual response can differ. And a lot of this is, another story is going to be programmed when you're in utero. So basically you're born with a predisposition to accumulate fat or not, and even to accumulate fat as you get older, if I'm right. But again, it always comes back to insulin, for the most part being that the one that you can influence by changing your diet. The others are pretty much beyond your control. The insulin you can change. You can flip that switch. And it's interesting because, like you just said, part of this has to do with our genetics. And also we're being fed, you know, conventional wisdom on nutrition is feeding us the wrong information. And people that are obese or overweight in society tend to be stigmatized, like they don't have a lot of willpower, they can't, you know, control their appetite. But again, with these things, genetics and them being fed the wrong information, it's not necessarily their fault if people are fat. It's not their fault at all. And that's one of the things that's so heartbreaking. I just read a book, uh, What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat. It came out a week ago. And the author's name, I hope I'm not getting this wrong, Aubrey Gordon. And it's a heartbreaking manifesto about dealing with obesity and the way society responds to obesity and the failure of diets to deal with obesity. And as I'm reading this, I'm looking for some understanding. Her, so she talks about saying, she says, you know, it's all a house of cards. Some people are just built fat, which I would agree with, although I would say some people are just born to be built fat. It's a thing. So the predisposition begins with the genes and in the womb. But I don't see any understanding in this book of why. Because you're not allowed to talk about hormones and obesity because that's perceived as an excuse. So you know that she knows that the calorie thing doesn't work for her, that she could eat less and all it'll do is make her hungry. She'll lose a little weight and she'll be hungry all the time. But she has no, there's no discussion of why she's, what could have happened hormonally to cause this obesity. And meanwhile, she's talking about eating the right way. And the right way, she's been taught, is less fat. Keep the, stay away from the fat, stay away from the fat, stay away from the fat. And, you know, again, this, my research as a journalist, and I, by, as a journalist, I had to become a historian and a historian of science. And until the 1960s, the conventional wisdom is that carbohydrates are fat. That's what my mother's generation believed and her mother's generation. So if you don't want to be fat, you need carbs. Okay. They, they went right to your hips. And you can find this as a line I quote in all my books, um, possibly all of them. Uh, first line of a 1963 British Journal of Nutrition article lived, written by two of the leading British dietitians. Every woman knows that carbohydrates are fat. Okay. And then between 1963 and 1985, the research community decides that um, dietary fat is a cause of heart disease. And carbohydrates go from being inherently fattening to heart-healthy diet foods. So by 1985, Jane Brody, who's the personal nutrition writer in the New York Times, most influential health journalist in America in the 1970s and 1980s, writes a best-selling diet book called The Good Food Book, in which she's saying, you know, we used to tell people to avoid carbs because we believe they're fattening, but now everybody should eat carbs, even pasta is a heart-healthy diet food. So carbs become healthy. They become what we should all eat. I remember this transition I lived through. It suddenly it used to be you had pasta like Thursday night was pasta night, the way Friday night was fish night, <laughs> and Sunday was barbecue. Suddenly it's like you're having pasta every night. Bagels went from being something, you know, people of my ethnic persuasion ate on Sundays to something we had for lunch every day. There was even a theory that carbohydrates couldn't make you fat because they didn't have fat in them. And so we all switch to this diet. And meanwhile, sugar itself, because the nutrition community is blaming everything on fat, sugar becomes benign. So it used to be sort of common sense that you need a lot of sugar if you wanted to be healthy, that you didn't drink a lot of Coca-Cola if you wanted to be lean and healthy. But now it's all, anything that's fat-free is perceived as a health food. So it's the same way today you can buy these products, you know, like a bottle of water that will tell you it's gluten-free. Back then, you could, you know, anything was, I doubt they did this, but I wouldn't have been surprised if Coca-Cola had said fat-free on the label. So you get this sort of paradigm shift in how Americans eat. They're avoiding fat, they're eating carbs, sugar is now a freebie. If it's Weight Watchers, it would be zero points. 
And even the protein we're eating is low fat. Again, if you look at the biochemistry, protein is going to stimulate insulin. Glucose can raise blood sugar, stimulate insulin secretion. So you basically could not have told Americans to eat a more fattening diet if you had tried. And simultaneously, we blew up like balloons. I mean, the obesity prevalence in this country almost has almost tripled and may have tripled by now since 1980. And it completely coincides with this shift in you know, the idea of carbs being fat and carbs being now part of healthy diet and foods. Coming back to the insulin piece here, there is a whole psychological aspect to it as well. You talk about in the book where just thinking about carbs causes the body to release a small bit of insulin. So we have that working against us as well. Well, so this was, you know, part of the advantage of being a journalist when you do this kind of research is you're not trapped in any particular discipline. And you can interview anyone. So for my first book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, I interviewed around 600 researchers. I still can't believe that number, by the way, but at some point I actually stopped and counted. And so it turns out there's a field of science called physiological psychology that studies, they're interested in hunger. So the idea is underlying physiological states, like what your body is doing determines your fundamental behaviors, like thirst or hunger, whether you eat, whether you drink, whether you go to the bathroom, it's all determined by what's happening inside your body. And their research is studying fat metabolism and endocrinology, people studying the hormonal regulation of fat. And it turns out when you read that literature, and it all goes back to Pavlov and Pavlov's dogs and a guy named Claude, it's a really, it's an old, well-established science that kind of vanished in the 1990s with the molecular biology revolution. But it turns out at any one time, if you're healthy and you don't have diabetes, um, when you wake up in the morning, uh, you have about a teaspoon worth of carbohydrate in your bloodstream, the blood glucose, literally one teaspoon. And if you're diabetic, you have a teaspoon and a half. I mean, it's crazy how small the numbers are. So you sit down for breakfast and you have like 500 calories, well, so 300 calories of cereal, and there's then you put some skim milk on it, and there's carbs and the lactose in the skim milk, and then you have grapefruit, and there's some carbs there, maybe a glass of orange juice. So by the time you're done, you've had the equivalent of maybe, I don't know, uh, 120 teaspoons of carbs that your body has to deal with. Remember, if you know, the difference between a teaspoon and a teaspoon and a half is diabetes. So the way it does that is as the carbs get into your bloodstream, it secretes insulin to tell your lean tissue to burn those carbs for fuel. You just ferociously start burning that stuff because we don't want it to elevate too high because that's toxic. And because it takes insulin time to start working, your body needs to be prepared for this flood of carbs that's coming. So there's something called a cephalic phase secretion. Cephalic means above the neck. So you start thinking about eating, and this is, remember I said this field goes back to Pavlov. Pavlov showed that when he showed dogs dinner, they would salivate. That's a Pavlovian response. So you start thinking about eating the cereal, you start to salivate, but you also start, your brain signals your pancreas to release insulin. So there's insulin in the bloodstream already when those carbs hit. Okay, it's a very like well-designed system to keep your blood sugar low. And so... It also works, the insulin tells your lean tissue, your cells, to, to start lowering the blood sugar already and starts telling the fat tissue to store fat. So you actually start getting hungry because it starts taking the fuel out of the circulation where you need it to fuel the cells. And this is also why an appetizer, well, the idea of an appetizer is usually a sort of carb-rich food that makes you hungry for the meal. So just the process of secreting this insulin before you eat, works to deal with the carbs after you eat, after you start eating, but it also works to make you hungry. And if you think about eating, you'll start to create, especially carb-rich meals, you'll start thinking about secreting insulin, which will make you hungry. And part of the reason, I don't know if the Madison Avenue is aware of this, but by showing commercials with delicious pizza or people enjoying a Coca-Cola, you know, the pause that refreshes or a delicious burger, they're getting your brain to stimulate insulin, which will make you hungry. And in the 1980s, there are actually very, very well-respected researchers theorizing that obese individuals had more of this cephalic phase insulin secretion, which they should, and that would make them hungrier 
when confronted with the same meal. So the example I use in the book is imagine you're walking through an airport. Imagine walking through an airport at all anymore. But remember, you walk through an airport and there's a Cinnabon in the airport, a Cinnabon store, and somehow you can always smell the Cinnabon like 200 feet away, which I'm sure they do on purpose, right? Because you smell it and you want it. If you're lean and you're what's called insulin sensitive, you're healthy, that smell, won't, you won't have much of an insulin response. So a lean person and an obese person are both walking by the cinnamon bun store. The lean person smells the cinnamon bun, hot, tasty, and says, yeah, I'm not hungry, and walks by. The obese person has a cephalic phase insulin response, and that raises insulin, and his fat tissue is very sensitive to insulin. So his fat tissue just sucks up all the fat in his bloodstream, and suddenly he's hungry. There's a whole theory, basically, about how your liver is the, the sense organ of fuel availability. And so now, just by smelling the cinnamon bun, the, the person who suffers from obesity is hungrier than the lean person. So now he's going to want to go in and eat the cinnamon bun because of this hormonal phenomenon, purely hormonal phenomenon. And if he does, everyone will look at him and say, oh, no, no wonder why he's fat, right? He's got no willpower. Whereas it's got nothing to do with willpower. It's got something, only it's about the sort of sensation of obesity, uh, excuse me, of hunger, the subjective sensation of hunger that he feels and his lean friend does not. And then he eats the cinnamon bun, continues to potentially be obese. Next time he passes by the cinnamon place, gets pulled right back in. So you can see how the cycle continues. Same thing happens. And the joke, of course, is that the lean friend goes in and eats a cinnamon bun with him. Nobody judges him, right? Because he's lean. They both eat a cinnamon bun and people look at the person with obesity and think he got fat because he ate the cinnamon bun and the lean person gets a free ticket. Roxanne Gay has a line about this in her remarkable memoir, Hunger, where she says uh, she's getting on an airplane with a friend. Roxanne, the book is about dealing with this morbid obesity problem. Um, Roxanne Gay weighed you know, well over 300 pounds. And she's getting on a plane with a friend, and the friend says, do you want to get a snack before we get on the plane? The friend says, no, people like me can't eat in public, because if we do, we'll be judged. You know, So it's sort of the one of my issues, I tend to get angry about this, because there's the burden of obesity physically is great. The burden psychologically is great, socially is great. There was a study done about 10 years ago, published in JAMA, that said children with obesity have less are lower satisfaction with life than children with cancer, which I find hard to believe, but that's what they reported. And then the implication is it's their fault, and they're constantly judged for it. And they don't, we, I would have been clinically obese by now. You don't get the right information. And the right, correct research is barely being done. Um, when the research is done, it's misinterpreted to fit this belief that obesity is caused by eating too much. So when it comes to this whole low-carb, high-fat way of eating, it all comes back to insulin, or at least the majority of what we're talking about comes back to insulin. So taking that even a step further, what are your thoughts on fasting or intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating, where we're actually taking food right out of the equation? Is that part of what you do you know, to maintain your health and well-being? Yeah, and I discuss this in the book, but I'll tell you a story about this. Um, Two years ago, there was a meeting in Zurich that was co-hosted by the British Medical Journal and a company called Swiss Re. Swiss Re is a reinsurance company, the biggest in the world. And I didn't know quite such companies exist, but reinsurance companies insure insurance companies. So they make money when people stay healthy. They don't have to pay out to the insurance company. So they have a vested interest in keeping people healthy. And the British Medical Journal and Swiss Re have both become open-minded sort of allies to the arguments we've been making. So they have this conference, and they, the Saturday part of the meeting is um, obesity, nutrition, chronic disease researchers from around the world discussing, uh, sort of arguing on some level about you know establishment figures discussing this and arguing as much as they will with people like me. And then on Sunday they had a special meeting on type 2 diabetes that was only the sort of low-carb world. This is at this beautiful conference center, Swiss Re runs in, outside of Zurich, and there's 50 of us sitting around this huge round table. And I asked as a test how many of these 50, and these are the sort of leading influential physicians and journalists and the 
low-carb world, how many were doing intermittent fasting, slash time-restricted eating, and 45 of the 50, including myself, raised our hands. So I did it as an experiment. I mean, just like I tried Atkins as an experiment, I thought everybody's talking about intermittent fasting. It was kind of pioneered by Dr. Jason Fung in Toronto, and I, I respect Jason. And so it's about four years ago now, I was at a giving a talk in um, uh, San Diego and then another talk in L.A., and I was sort of basically traveling for three days. And so all if I wanted to stop eating breakfast and so fast from after dinner around 8 o'clock at night till my lunchtime at 1 o'clock the next day, all I had to do was stop eating airplane food, which is relatively easy. At home, I cook breakfast, make breakfast for my family, so it's hard for me not to eat freshly cooked eggs or bacon but I could skip airplanes. And so after three days, I didn't miss it. I had more energy. My head was clearer in the mornings. Um, I wasn't hungry. Over the course of five months, I lost about a dozen pounds. I didn't think I had to lose. Like I was happy with my weight, but then I got five pounds thinner. So my belief is, well, first of all, intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding, to me, are kind of the flip side of the same coin. Like I say that I fast from 8 o'clock to 1 in the afternoon, which is, what, 17 hours without food. So that, to me, I'm doing intermittent fasting, but I could also say that I only eat between 1 and 8, so that's 7 hours with food. That's time-restricted eating. I restrict it to a 7-hour window. It gets a little more subtle than that. There are different ways to do intermittent fasting and different ways. My thinking is... Going back to Yellow and Burson, if you want to get fat out of your fat tissue, your fat has to see the negative signal of insulin deficiency. And by compressing the time you're eating or lengthening the time you're not eating, you lengthen the amount of time during the day that your fat is seeing that negative signal. So you lengthen the amount of time that your fat is mobilizing fat and using it for fuel. Because as soon as you start eating, you're going to secrete some insulin. even just a little insulin on a ketogenic diet. So I rarely talk to anyone anymore on low-carb diets who do not also intermittently fast. And what's interesting is to throw this in, again, the next book will be about diabetes. So I've been buried in the diabetes literature going back to the 18th century. And intermittent fasting, the term was used 120 years ago to mean skipping eating on an entire day usually. And it was considered a sort of vitally important adjunct to dietary therapy for diabetes. And you basically give the pancreas a day off every week and it functions better. The science behind it is not that well-developed, but again, it's a very easy thing for people to test, to try experiment with. And um, like I did it as an experiment, I stayed with it because I liked it, I felt better. I don't miss it. I don't miss breakfast. So, uh, you know, you can experiment. And for people who are nervous about eating all the saturated fat or the animal products that comes with a ketogenic or a low-carb, high-fat diet, not eating for a day doesn't come with any of that baggage. Gary, I know I got to let you go here soon, but I want to end on this final thought, and that's moderation, because we've been talking, you know, about different diets, and a lot of them are pretty extreme. But what about for the average person out there who, you know, they're maybe maintaining a pretty healthy weight, but they're thinking about cutting carbs down a little bit. It seems pretty, you know, on off whether insulin's released into the blood or not when we're, you know, partaking in a high fat, low carb diet. But is there any room in between there for somebody who wants to still include some carbs? Is it basically worth their time to like cut down on carbs, but still include some in the diet? This gets back to the question you asked about individual variation. And I should have said, that clearly the world is full of people who can tolerate carb-rich diets and stay healthy and live to 120 or 100. I mean, we all know them. They tend to drive us crazy because they can eat foods we can't. So that's kind of the argument here is that those of us, that is the argument, those of us who gain weight easily, who you know predisposed to become overweight, obese, diabetic, the reason we do so is because of the carb content of our diet. And if we want to stop that from happening, we have to have more or less rigid abstinence to those carbs. Some people are fine with them. 
they can metabolize them, they can stay healthy, their hearts, you know, their blood pressure stays low, their blood sugar stays under control. So, you know, for those people who are a little heavier than they want to be, it's just a question of experimenting. I, I'm always surprised, and it's one of the reasons I wrote this book, the idea that, you know, we have to be on a ketogenic diet. I was actually being interviewed by a Washington Post reporter who said she read the book, but it was hard to believe, who kept saying, so why do you think everyone should be on a ketogenic diet? It's like, I don't think everyone should be on a ketogenic diet. It's crazy to think everyone should be on a ketogenic diet. It's like some people, if you are overweight, obese, diabetic, predisposed to get that way, then this is physiologically, biochemically, you know, endocrinologically the diet you should try, the way of eating you should try to fix it, if you want to. And that's a key issue also. And for the rest of us, that phrase, I like that phrase, I repeat it over and over again, more or less rigid abstinence. If you're pretty healthy now and you're happy with your weight, then less rigid abstinence. But the other idea I wanted to get across, and we broached this with the cephalic phase insulin thing, for those of us who really have significant weight problems and really want to try and fix them, then we're talking rigid abstinence. Then it's like, you know, smokers who want to quit, alcoholics who want to get healthy, you know, then we have to almost treat them like an addiction. Actually, a lot of the physicians I interviewed said, you know, I don't think of my clinic as a weight loss clinic. I think of it as a carbohydrate addiction clinic. Um, for these people, you know, we have to learn to live without them. And the good thing, which I all say, is as you get rid of the carbs in the diet and you replace them with fat, and your body starts metabolizing fat for fuel instead of carbs for fuel, you'll start craving fat-rich foods rather than carb-rich fuel. So your cravings should actually change with time. Your sugar, sweet tooth should slowly go away. I know this is hard for people, but I also, my view is, I used to be a smoker. So I know what it's like to fight struggle for years to miss something. But I also know what it's like to get over that and be, you know, pick your scatological term, delighted that I don't smoke it. So, and I feel that, so that's, it's sort of, Sure, many people, you know, have your potatoes and love them. If your body can do it, that's terrific. But if you really want to be healthy, the healthiest you can be, and if you really want to be the leanest you can be, which for many of us won't be as lean as we'd like, then it's rigid abstinence. So it really depends on the person. For all of us, this can be a great tool on the tool belt. Yeah. And the other point I made, I talked about this in the book. I was at a diabetes conference in um, Aspen, one of my favorite places to go, but it always makes me feel you know, disheartened that I chose a career in which billionaire was not one of the possible you know, endpoints. Anyway, I'm at this diabetes conference. I'm talking to this young woman who had been in a, a nutrition study that actually a not-for-profit that I co-founded had helped fund, and it had compared a very low-carb diet to a very low-fat diet. And this was hosted at Stanford. And this woman was, had been obese her, you know, since adolescence, childhood. And she showed me her weight chart on this diet. And the first three months, she was randomized to the low carb arm of the study. And the goal of that study was to get them on a diet that was as close to keto as they could get. And for the first three months, she lost 30 pounds over the first three months. And she showed me, she had it all charted on her phone. And at three months, they decided they didn't want to lose subjects from the study. It's a very expensive when you have a study that's supposed to last a year and your studies drop out because they don't like the diet. So at the end of three months, they started recommending that they add some carbs back into the diet. So it's fruit, if nothing else, like berries, because um, they thought that people who thought the diet was too restrictive might be tempted to stick around. So from a science perspective, you can argue it made sense, but over the next three months, she only lost five pounds. And then the researchers recommended that they add more carbs back. This was a sort of misreading of the Atkins program, and very bizarre, and had I known about it fully when we were funding them, I would have argued a little more vociferously. But so over the next six months, she lost no more weight. So she loses 30 pounds over the first three, five over the second, she goes from, I think it was 240 to 210 to 205. She's maybe five foot seven. And then she never loses another pound. 
So from her perspective, it wasn't really worth it, okay? But my point was, had she stuck with that rigid abstinence, not even added the berries back, she might have gone from 240 down to 140. We don't know where that curve would have stopped. She might have only lost five pounds. We don't know that either. But it's conceivable that she would have gotten to 140. And in 140, she'd have been as uh, lean as she'd ever been. And she might have decided that the berries weren't worth it and that bagels aren't worth it and pasta isn't worth it. And she doesn't miss them because she's healthy and relatively lean. And now you have just an entirely different mindset. You know, people often, when they start these diets, they say, well, can I eat this? Can I eat that? What about this? And I say, that's the wrong way to think about it. Imagine you're quitting smoking. You're not going to say, can I have a cigarette on Tuesdays? Or is it okay for me to have a cigarette when I drink with my friends? Because you know you're never going to get there. So for three months or two months or one month or three weeks, abstain. Find out what your body wants to do without carbohydrates in the diet and how you feel about it. And if it's doing good things and you feel good about it, keep doing it for another month or another three months. And you might get to the point that I got to and a lot of people get to. You're not a, complying to a diet or adhering to a diet. You're adhering to being healthy. And you know your body works best without these carbs. And then, again, when I said originally it was called how to think about how to eat, that's why, how I wanted people to think about it. Can you get to a point where you're healthy and then you can make the decision? Is this worth it? Or maybe I can compromise. Maybe I miss ice cream. I'll have ice cream once a week. I'll get five pounds heavier. Then I can live with the five pounds if I get my ice cream. But first you get healthy and lean or leaner, and then you make the decision. I like that idea. Take it as far as you can. See the potential there and then decide if you want to play with it a little bit. If you don't do it, you'll never know. I agree. Gary, really appreciated your time here. This was a great conversation. Love the new book, The Case for Keto. Other than listeners getting a copy of the book, how can they connect with you? They can reach me through my website, GaryCalves.com. And uh, I do tweets. I'm on Twitter, but I may be breaking a record for fewest tweets for most followers. I, just, I don't pay enough attention to it. And if your local bookstore is open, buy it there as of December 29th. If it's not, it's Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Great point. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Jesse. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Gary. I sure did, and I really enjoyed his new book, The Case for Keto. Be sure and get yourself a copy. I'd love to hear what you thought of the episode over on Instagram. You can tag at Ultimate Health Podcast. You can take a screenshot of the players you're listening or take a picture or short video clip of yourself, and I'd love to connect with you over there. For full show notes, head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 387. There's links there to everything we discussed today and so much more, so be sure and check those out. And before I let you go, I want to give some love to my editor and engineer, Jace Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, thank you for all you do. And thank you for listening to the show. Have an awesome week. I'll talk to you soon. Wishing you ultimate health.